we're starting our first um, panel, which is looking at reassessing uncertainty and stability as core nuclear concepts. So if, if we say that panelists have 10 minutes and I will be um, uh, keeping an eye on that on my phone, on the time. And um, what I will do is try and what works best for panelists, a note in the chat, or would you like me just to intercede and say we have two minutes? I know when I present, the last thing I'm doing is looking at chat. Um, how does that sound? James, Fabian, Arthur, you're okay for me just to say we have two minutes? Yeah, perfectly, yeah. Work yeah, that's good. That's good. Really. Okay, let's do that. I think that's um, more straightforward than using the chat. Okay, James, so if you'd like to start and... Um, uh, have you got slides? Would you like me to? I can. I'll set it up so that if you have, you yes, can. Yes, I have. Yeah, I can share those on my side if that's possible. Yeah, it's, so yeah sure. Feel free that. to share your screen. Yep. Okay. Here we go. And we are actually starting pretty much on time, which which is good. That's a first. I'm normally late for everything. So, um, so James, fire away. All right, guys, uh, so I'm, I'm delighted again to engage with, with BISA GNN group, um, and hopefully this is the, the final one in, in the virtual world. Uh, thanks to you know, Nicola and Patricia for organizing the event, and to Laura for acting as, as chair. Um, in, in BISA tradition, this paper has evolved uh, somewhat since I submitted my abstract, uh, so please uh, you know, bear, bear with me on the, on the content. The paper itself is part of a series that applies Cold War era cornerstone nuclear theorizing concepts, including deterrence, stability, security dilemma, inadvertent escalation, and accidental escalation in a nuclear uh, domain to examine uh, primarily the impact of introducing AI and immersion technology more broadly into the nuclear enterprise. Uh, the project's overarching argument, um, if I don't make it to the end of this talk, is that the prevailing wisdom in the world of asymmetric nuclear armed dyads nihilistic non-state actors, and especially intelligent machines, read AI, is misguided and arguably obsolete. Okay, so I'll begin this brief presentation, probably slightly briefer than I anticipated. Uh, I'll outline some of the novel ways in which AI and autonomy might affect deterrence theory and practice. Then I'll consider a few arguments for and against, for and against automating decisions to machines, especially in a strategic environment. I will then highlight some trade-offs of this potential deterrence and stability paradigm shift and close by outlining some further risk reduction measures I believe we can probably flesh out more in the Q&A session. So at its core, deterrence is about influencing an adversary sense of risk, cost-benefit analysis, and decision-making outcomes. So it requires a deep understanding of the adversaries, interests, priorities, objectives, and above all, their perceptions. That is how adversaries view others' capabilities and intentions, especially, for example, the other side's philosophy of employment and military force, will crucially influence the deterrent effects these systems have, and arguably the risk of miscalculation and escalation and accident if these assessments prove wrong. Deterrence and strategic bargaining can fail between rational actors in asymmetric information situations where incentives exist to manipulate this information, as well as where credible commitment is problematic and diversions exist between adversaries on key policy issues. To be sure, my research has found that these conditions are all dialed up and amplified in the digital age. In this paper, I argue that AI and autonomy can undermine deterrence and stability in several ways, including in making it easier to find nuclear assets, attacking nuclear command, control, and communication systems, for example, with AI-enhanced cyber weapons, and using drones in swarms in preemptive strikes against nuclear deterrence assets. This chart, what I can uh, happily distribute, shows or depicts AI applications that are currently being tested, developed, and increasing number of cases already deployed within the broader nuclear deterrence architecture, including things like early warning systems, intelligence, surveillance, and recon, command and control systems, and non-deterrent or non-nuclear deterrence operations. Again, things like cyber warfare, missile defense, and counterface technology. 
So how might delegating decisions to machines affect stability, deterrence, and escalation risk? Now, during crisis conditions, the deterrent effect of AI and immersion technology, very much like either capabilities, is predicated on the perceived risks associated with a particular capability it enables or enhances. The higher the uncertainty generated by, generated by capacity, thus deploying AI augmented capability into a crisis might encourage an adversary to act more cautiously, thereby increasing its deterrent effect. So somewhat counterintuitively, states may view further automation of their command and control systems as an easy way to manage escalation and perhaps bolster in deterrence. That is signaling to an adversary that an attack or even the threat of one might trigger a nuclear response. In other words, there's a prima facie argument, albeit a reasonably febrile one, that building automated response mechanisms into nuclear systems might resolve the logical paradox inherent with rational-based classical deterrence that is premised on MAD and the will to retaliate, thus ensuring mutual, mutual vulnerability and perhaps in ensuring or improving stability. However, because of the difficulty of demonstrating a posture like this before a crisis or conflict, this kind of implicit threat, something like Dr. Strange loves doomsday machine on steroids, might equally worsen crisis stability. A critical factor in this uh, scenario is to what degree a particular technology, in this case AI, disproportionately affects states' perceptions of the prevailing balance of power. Besides the confusion and uncertainty that would inevitably be result from mixing various and potential unknown levels of human to machine interaction, and AIs reacting to situations in non-human ways at machine speed could dramatically increase inadvertent risk and, and risk deterrence failure. This risk will be further compounded by an overconfidence in and a reliance on AI decision-making tools known in psychology parlance as automation bias, meaning that false negatives and positives could go unnoticed or even ignored. We saw in the recent defeat of a human F-16 jet fighter pilot by an AI in a dart for sponsored alpha dog challenge, how AIs performing in complex, dynamic, albeit virtual environments can compress decision-making and use very unorthodox or non-human tactics in a high stakes game of human to machine chicken. So how might mixing various levels of human machine interaction affect deterrence? We saw in recent experimental wargaming by Rancor in the US, the effects of mixing various degrees of human machine collaboration on crisis dynamics. And they revealed some interesting preliminary findings. They found in summary that all things being equal, high levels of autonomy combined with humans in the loop. We found there that escalation risk unsurprisingly is lower. Juxtapose when human decision-making uh, was out of the loop and AIs were more involved in decision-making, we saw unsurprisingly the risk of escalation to be ramped up. This hypothesis was attributed to the fact that human involvement in decisions generally allow for more times to de-escalate. And for now, at least, humans are thought better at understanding signaling compared to an AI. Conceptually speaking, an AI algorithm that is optimized to pursue pre-programmed goals could very easily misinterpret an adversary signaling a desire for resolution to avoid conflict or de-escalate a situation thus complicating the very delicate balance between an actor's willingness to escalate a situation as the very last result to a nuclear level and keeping the option open to step back from the brink. To be sure with these scenarios, there's several open questions about how the various parts of this hypothetical synergy would work in practice. For example, would commanders on the ground become too reliant on an AI, believing it to be superior at its own job or juxtapose might commanders equally distrust AI's recommendations because of its fuzzy machine logic? And might an adversary calculate risks very differently due to the presence of non-human agents on the opposing side? In short, 
while delegating decisions to machines during a conflict may well lower the risk to human life and potentially reduce accidents and miscalculation, the absence of normative deterrence or escalation frameworks, things like fire breaks, signaling, or de-escalation ramps, will likely further to compress or perhaps entirely remove various parts of Herman Kahn's Cold War era metaphorical escalation ladder with uncertain and inherently destabilizing outcomes. You have two minutes. Thank you, thank you. I'll skip over this uh, machines and catalytic war risks. This is war coming from potential um, impact of non-state actors nefariously um, increasing the risk of accidental warfare between nuclear armed states. I can send you an article that I published on this uh, recently to kind of uh, uh, give you an idea of my, my ideas here. In terms of the trade-offs, and I'll finish here, of the employment of AI and autonomy in the nuclear enterprise, we can see here a, a multitude of trade-offs that hopefully should pursue, persuade policymakers to pursue and consider how and whether AI power capabilities might strengthen or complicate the stability, deterrence and escalation in an increasingly fragile multipolar world order. And in terms of the lines of effort that we can use to manage these risks, these can be categorized into four broad areas, enhancing the safety and reliability of safety of nuclear weapons, hardening nuclear systems and processes, improving command and control protocols and mechanisms, designing more robust safeguards to contain the consequences of error, accidents and overconfidence in nuclear control, and modifying existing arms control verification processes and encouraging bilateral, multilateral confidence building measures and stability dialogue on emerging technology more broadly. We can discuss some of these measures in more detail during the Q&A. And just to end with a quote on the, the father of modern computing, Alan Turning, who said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but there is plenty that needs to be done. And I'll thank the panel here for their attention. And just to stress a lot of this research is still work in progress. So I very much look forward to your feedback, comments, and questions. Thank you, Patricia. Lovely, thank you, excellent. Thank you for finishing um, so brilliantly on time and uh, for a very interesting and uh, thought-provoking um, presentation. That's great, thank you. Um, I think what we'll do is have each of the presentations and then have time for questions afterwards. Otherwise it, it gets a little bit too bitty, I think. Um, so the next, next person up is Fabian. Um, have I said that right, Fabian? Have I pronounced your name right? There's nothing, nothing worse than having it wrong. No, you did. Um, oh, all okay, good. lovely. Um, and Fabian go. is um, reconsidering conventional nuclear integration from capability to function. And I, I've just realised that very rudely of me, I haven't introduced you all. Um, so could I maybe ask must ask each um, uh, panelist if they could just say a little bit about themselves before they begin? Because I think we're such a small group. It's a much nicer way of um, kicking things off and um, it helps frame um, the, the research and the presentation. So I'm putting you on the spot a bit, a little bit. I apologise for that, but I think it might be nice just to uh, just so we know um, sort of your background and a little bit about um, about this. So just where you're from would be helpful. Sure, absolutely. Um, about your background. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my name is Fabian. I am from Germany. I, I recently finished my, or completed my studies uh, at the War Studies Department, uh, KCL. Currently, I'm a, a research assistant at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, where I support two, two projects. One is uh, related to defense innovation, and the other one uh, is the Missile Dialogue Initiative. And I'm also currently preparing a PhD on um, this issue of, of the, the blurring between the conventional and, and nuclear domain. And what I'm going to talk about today touches partly upon the, the topic that I have in mind, uh, but not entirely. And uh, I also want to stress that uh, the paper that I'm presenting today um, is very much in its early stages. Um, so I would like to, to focus you um, 
for you and your, your feedback maybe on the, the bigger picture. And if I drop a couple of words, uh, like, you know, Linden, I'm looking at you like strategic stability um, that are a bit more contentious, uh, don't freak out and, and just keep the bigger picture in mind. Um, perfect. Then uh, let me start. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, conventional nuclear integration. Uh, in particular, I want to focus on the, the role of function in this process. And here we go. Uh, I define conventional nuclear integration as the intentional and unintentional combining of conventional nuclear forces and missions for the purpose of realizing strategic theater and or tactical objectives. And I think the issue of, of conventional nuclear integration is not necessarily new. Already during the Cold War, um, conventional nuclear integration was very much visible, for example, in the deployment of dual capable aircraft or the deployment of Warsaw Pact uh, theater range missiles. Uh, what is perhaps new is the extent to which it is practiced today and in particular, states seem to deploy an increasing amount of dual capable weapon systems, offensive and defensive in nature, such as missile capabilities, early warning systems, employed for both conventional and nuclear purposes. I think most attention in this regard has been paid to the issue of warhead ambiguity relating to the idea that it becomes difficult to say whether a missile system is armed with a conventional or a nuclear warhead, and this can result in target ambiguity, potentially leading to inadvertent uh, targeting of nuclear assets. And then overall, this process has been said to increase nuclear escalation pressures and undermine strategic stability. I think this, this focus on these technical capability related considerations is very much important. However, I argue that this capability focused perspective should be complemented by, by one on, on function. I argue that these technical issues, um, next to these technical issues, we should also have a look at, at function. In other words, the tasks and purposes related to the conventional and nuclear domains and the blurring of these functions. And the first step, this requires a reconceptualization of the nuclear and conventional domains as functional domains. I think with the, the word domain, it's, it's very much, you know, one of these words that we use all the time in our field, but we rarely define it. And following my research, I, I come to the conclusion that a very simple and short definition is preferable. So I define it as a distinct operational environment in which state actors can maneuver to create effects. And really, I think the key notion here is the distinctness of different domains. So unless a domain is not distinct from other domains, there is no reason to denote a unique operational environment and it does not make sense to speak of a domain. Um, this creates issues with regard to the conventional and nuclear domains to the extent that these domains can even be said to exist, namely, how do they differ from each other? Um, their environments are essentially the same. They consist of land, maritime, air, space, and cyberspace. Capabilities operating within these domains are essentially similar, relating to similar types of capabilities, which um, are, as we've seen, increasingly dual capable, dual capable in nature. And then also the effects are the same, as actors in both domains intend to achieve or threaten destructive effects. So how do they then differ at all? I argue that the key factor separating the conventional and nuclear domains is function, meaning the tasks and purposes of these operational environments. State actors generally maneuver within the conventional and nuclear domains to achieve different tasks and purposes. In other words, they attach different functions to distinct domains. Strategic functions have been attached to the nuclear domain. Traditionally, these have included counterforce and countervalue purposes. This means that conduct in the nuclear domain has generally included two missions. One, to threaten the survivability of the enemy's nuclear arsenal, and two, to jeopardize high-value political and socioeconomic targets inside the enemy's territory, threatening the state's connectivity and its ability to function normally. In contrast, non-strategic functions have prevailed in the conventional domain. The key function of the conventional domain is, of course, warfighting. In addition, conventional non-strategic functions include substrategic deterrence or the gradual imposition of pain, meaning a very important escalation control function has been attached to the conventional domain. In addition, the functions of the nuclear domain have traditionally been recognized as a ultima ratio, and in contrast, conventional functions are much more readily available, constituting a primum remedium, if you like to call it like that. Um, to be clear, I don't argue that a perfect functional separation exists or has ever existed, keeping the nuclear and conventional domains entirely distinct. 
For example, since the demise of the massive retaliation doctrine in the late 1950s and the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons for battlefield use, the warfighting function has not been entirely exclusive to the conventional domain anymore. In addition, a key function in both domains, for example, relates to the acquisition of international prestige. Nuclear and conventional weapons, as scholarship has shown, have been deployed with the aim of increasing the state's international standing. Nevertheless, I think distinct functions operating in the different domains have constituted a factor separating the two operational environments. Generally speaking, strategic functions have been attached to the nuclear domain and non-strategic ones have been attached to the conventional domain. However, this functional separation has started to break down in a process that I call functional blurring. Increasingly, state actors attach strategic functions to the conventional domain. For example, Russian doctrine and military strategy is relatively open about the potential employment of its conventional missile arsenal for countervalue functions in order to destroy NATO's warfighting potential early on during a conflict. On the other hand, NATO has started to deploy increasing numbers of conventional precision strike capabilities with hard target kill capability, which could credibly threaten hardened strategic targets in Russia, such as underground command and control bunkers or missile silos. In the absence of declarations to the contrary, a counterforce function relating to these conventional capabilities can be inferred. Overall, strategic functions are nowadays increasingly being attached to conventional domain, whether this happens through an explicit process, as in the case of Russia, or occurs implicitly, as in the case of NATO. As a result, the conventional and nuclear domains integrate further and become increasingly inseparable. So why, why do I think this is important? Um, I think functional blurring can undermine both crisis and arms race stability. On the one hand, the deployment of conventional weapons can be seen as preparing uh, for counterforce or countervalue strikes in such a scenario, heightening risks and insecurities and crisis. On the other hand, states may feel compelled to take into account conventional deployments when deciding on nuclear force posture requirements, increasing the number of nuclear weapons deployed, and of course, so, uh, of course also with regard to conventional weapons. However, I think this process also yields important implications with regard to arms control and can highlight also new opportunities. Nowadays, the prospects of re regulating the deployment of conventional weapon systems, especially conventional precision strike capabilities, seems extremely unlikely. Yet, rather than regulating the deployment of conventional weapons, perhaps we should focus on regulating the use. In other words, functional arms control may be a way forward. Declaratory policy announcing, for example, that NATO's conventional precision strike capabilities do not play a role in NATO's nuclear planning could be a first step. Of course, I recognize that such a measure would be, rel would be relatively cheap and uncomplicated. And although, and of course, it can only constitute uh, the beginning of a larger process. Finally, I think this functional perspective also highlights the importance of non-material factors. When it comes to conventional nuclear integration, strategic and doctrinal considerations are as important as the capabilities they relate to. And with that in mind, I would like to close my remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to, to feedback and questions. Um, and of course, also to the, the next speakers. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, you're actually two minutes ahead, which is which is really lovely. Um, while we've got those two minutes, if I could just apologise, I know there's some some notes in the chat. I I should have allowed James the chance to introduce himself. So James, if we've got the two minute pause, uh, I can't see you. Ah, I, I don't know if you're there. If you're, if I caught you the moment that you've just quickly stepped away, may have stepped away. So I will introduce James to everybody, just to say um, that James is um, a, a lecturer in strategic studies at the University of Aberdeen. And if you look in the chat, he's included his paper, um, uh, which you, you might want to sort of uh, copy and paste uh, to be able to view later. So it's quite nice to have that pause just to uh, just to say that. And um, when he comes back, I'll let him know. Oh, hi, James. <laughs> the, oh, yeah. the is, I have seen it. I've, just, I've just introduced you to everyone and just highlighted that your paper's in the chat. So I don't know if you'd like to say anything more, if you're happy with that. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Thank you. I don't want to delay proceedings. We had a, we had a bit of a, a snowstorm up in Aberdeen, so I've been uh, oh, uh, shoveling a bit of snow off the car, but I'm back now. <laughs> okay, so yeah, quick, well, nothing like a bit of exercise, you know. <laughs> I hope you're all okay. Uh, I did see trees down and everything else. Yeah, it's the joy of the winter. 
Um, excellent. Thank you for that. OK, so if we move on to Arthur uh, and again, Arthur, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, you can share your screen if you've got slides. If you haven't got slides, that's OK. Lovely. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think you should be seeing my slides yeah, now. Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. So hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And it's great to see some familiar faces. And special thanks to you, Dr. Leveringhouse, and everybody else who made this uh, event possible. My name is Arthur. I'm from Hungary. And I graduated from the Department of War Studies uh, this summer. And I'm currently interning at the Nuclear Policy Directorate at NATO headquarters in Brussels. And I would quickly add that my research does not represent the views of my employer. So if we take a look at the security environment, we can observe how missile threats are becoming increasingly sophisticated. And as a result, states feel the need to come up with concepts and capabilities that could help them counter these missile threats. And I'm now excited to present my analysis of one particular concept, the concept of left of launch, which gained traction in the United States in the past years. Okay, so hopefully the slide is moving. So let me start with the uh, bottom line up front. The term left of launch refers to the neutralization of missile threats even before the missiles could be launched. To use a metaphor, this is about shooting down the archer instead of uh, waiting to deal with incoming arrows. And this term has been used repeatedly in US defense circles over the past decade, However, it is not uh, defined in US joint doctrine. Uh, in addition, and this is where things get really interesting, both unclassified primary sources and the secondary literature demonstrate a lack of clarity regarding the key details of this concept. To use an extreme example, there is no clarity on whether left of launch would mean a non-kinetic cyber attack against a limited missile threat or an all-out preemptive counterforce attack with kinetic or even nuclear forces. And this is a pretty broad spectrum. So we should ask the question, why is all of this significant? Well, defensive measures against missile threats are a partial solution at best. So going on the offense is not necessarily an, an unfounded idea, but you need to have clear concepts for your capabilities. So very briefly about the structure of my presentation, I will first situate the left of launch concept in the broader missile defense context, then uh, followed by a summary of the research problem and my research design. And after, after this, I will discuss four main conceptual issues before offering a few uh, concluding points. So just to set the scene uh, for my presentation, let's take a quick look at the broader missile defense context. What are the options uh, when it comes to countering missile threats? The picture on the left depicts active missile defense, which is about intercepting missiles that are already on their way towards your forces. Additionally, you can also rely on passive missile defense uh, to minimize or mitigate the consequences of an attack against you. But since both active and passive missile defense would try to deal with incoming missiles after they have been launched, they can be labeled right of launch. Meanwhile, as I said, left of launch means engaging the adversarial missile system prior to launch. If we look at the uh, doctrinal documents, like the joint publication on countering air and missile threats from 2017, which was produced by the joint US Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, we can see that this offense-oriented approach is not just one option, but actually in doctrinal terms, offense is the preferred option for defense. So that said, it all seems fairly straightforward. You could even ask, what is the issue here? Well, there are a number of issues. Uh, the first one is that the above mentioned joint publication does not mention this term left of launch. And we do not really have a detailed official definition elsewhere. The second is the notion of neutralizing missile threats. Uh, the second is that the notion of, of uh, neutralizing missile threats prior to launch is a largely overlooked topic. And most of the academic and, and think tank discourse focuses on the feasibility, the cost, and the strategic implications of active missile defense. So there's a gap here in research. And the third one is that in the early phase of my research, I realized that uh, there's a decent amount of unclassified publicly available primary source material, and nobody has conducted a comprehensive overview of, of these sources before. So I put forward uh, two interrelated research questions. The first one is how left of launch is conceptualized in uh, official US primary sources, and how, if at all, has the understanding of this concept evolved since it has been mentioned for the first time in 2011. 
So to answer these questions, I systematically investigated more than 40 uh, publicly available primary sources. These included Department of Defense documents, public speeches, uh, congressional testimonies of, of US military leaders and senior officials, uh, budgetary documents and doctrinal documents. And perhaps this is the right time to mention that an obvious limitation uh, of my research was that it was limited to unclassified documents. Still, I would argue that the highly classified nature of a topic does not excuse um, contradictory statements when speaking about it publicly uh, before Congress, uh, for example. So I just put uh, three key documents on this slide, which are uh, more or less milestones in the evolution of the left of launch concept, but in the interest of time, let me proceed to my findings and I'm happy to return to these uh, in the Q&A. So I will now go one by one through the four main conceptual issues concerning left of launch. And I will try to demonstrate the mismatch between the literature and the primary sources. And I will also present my uh, results uh, in terms of the conceptual analysis. So the first question concerns the definitional boundaries of this term. Because if you think about it, left of launch is a temporal concept. It represents a right close, left open interval, where the rightmost end of the interval is the distinct moment of the missile launch. What is unclear, however, is the leftmost boundary. Hmm. Essentially, where does left of launch begin? Unfortunately, the secondary literature does not reflect on this issue at all. And when we turn to primary sources, we have two very interesting but diverging perspectives. Uh, the narrower view considers left of launch as an attack against the missile platforms themselves to prevent launch. Meanwhile, there are a number of congressional testimonies which discuss a more holistic view, uh, holistic view of engaging the entire kill chain, including the supply chain of the entire missile complex of the adversary. And of course, in this case, our left of launch concept would uh, overlap with counterproliferation. So the verdict on this first problem is that although primary sources provide some nuance to the definitional boundaries, uh, overall, the uncertainties still remain about how early left of launch operations could actually begin. The second key question concerns the capabilities that could be used in a left of launch mission. The literature is divided on this because uh, a number of experts consider left of launch only to be non-kinetic. Uh, just to clarify, kinetic would be a missile strike, an airstrike, or a drone strike, and non-kinetic would mean offensive cyber, uh, electronic warfare, or directed energy. Still, in contrast to the literature, most primary sources already back in 2015 and ever since assert very clearly that both kinetic and non-kinetic means are on the table. They are relevant, and this perspective is also reflected in the official declaratory, declaratory policy documents of uh, left of launch. And what is really interesting that there was one single testimony by a former deputy assistant secretary of defense who talked about how uh, nuclear forces could be potential means uh, uh, of left of launch, although other sources publicly do not confirm uh, nor deny this. So turning to the third question, it's, it's about the uh, missile, the type of missiles that would be targeted in left of launch operations. Because the original uh, internal DOD memo that kicked off uh, the left of launch discussions in November 2014 focused only on ballistic missiles. However, three years later, the declaratory policy documents already included ballistic and cruise missiles. And in subsequent uh, congressional testimonies, we can see that it's ballistic, cruise, and also hypersonic potentially. So I think this is the aspect where we can observe. You have um, two minutes. Got it, thanks. Most clearly how the evolution of the concept has come with the expansion of its focus. And last but not least, the fourth uncertainty uh, about the concept is the scale in which left of launch operations would be conducted. Simply put, are we talking about a tactical concept? Would left of launch be about engaging rogue missile threats? Or is this about conducting a disarming all-out first strike, potentially against uh, North Korean or even Chinese strategic forces? So the literature is again divided into two camps, as you can see on the slide. And primary sources are likewise ambiguous. On the one hand, the proliferation of cheap um, and simple ballistic missiles is often cited in testimonies as the key reason for con considering left of launch options in the first place. On the other hand, if you look at the 2017 National Security Strategy, or the 2019 Missile Defense Review, they refer to defeating missile threats prior to launch in the homeland missile defense context. So that's a strategic sense. And turning to my conclusions, 
um, the findings of my research uh, suggest that the lack of conceptual clarity is still a persistent problem in these four key aspects. And this will be a problem for the US because getting this offense-oriented approach right in terms of the operational and the budgetary perspective would require a clearer conceptualization of what exactly left of launch is and what it isn't. But the good news is that there are several ongoing review processes in the DOD right now that might provide some answers early next year. And finally, I hope that my conceptual analysis could open up several avenues for further research. And I also hope to look at some of these issues in the future. Once again, thanks for having me. I welcome your feedback. And now back to you, Patricia. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting um, presentation. I've learned some new. I've learned some new things from that. Um, uh, that that's very good. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so then we move on to Henrietta. Hi, Henrietta. Nice to see you. Um, if you could just again just introduce yourself and um, and I don't know if you have slides. Pop pop the slides up. If not, then feel free just to um, just to to press on with your presentation. Thank you very much, Patricia. And no, I'm not going to be sharing slides, so that makes that uh, maybe easier. I don't know. Um, so my name is Henrietta Wilson. Um, I do freelance research in weapons of mass destruction disarmament, and I've been involved in non-governmental work in the UK and in Europe, um, in, in, in university groups and also in conventional kind of think tank NGO sort of work. Um, I'm now visiting research fellow at King's um, and I work um, as a consultant for SOAS um, and I'm teaching at the University of Bristol. Um, and what I'm going to talk about are instabilities um, that derive from verification. I think the panel up till now have been talking much more about offensive capabilities. I'm taking it back to um, how the weapons regulations. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak and thank you uh, to all the talks. I'm looking forward to everybody, everybody's um, com comments. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about is very much work in progress and that's partly why I'm not sharing slides. Um, it's pretty fluid at this stage. I'm thinking about online open source research and its implications to treaty verification. Um, and my talk is gonna be very simple. I'm gonna start by talking about some definitions and some traditional understandings of verification. And then I'm going to be looking at the relationship between open source research and verification. So the first thing to say is what I mean by open source research. Um, and I'm taking a very broad definition. It means any sort of research that uses publicly available tools or information. We've already had some of the panelists mentioning how they use open sources. Um, in, from doctrines or from newspapers. I'd also add to that list that people use uh, published data from companies, like the equivalent of the UK's company's house um, and uh, parliamentary records. So open sources have been a mainstay of, of research by academics, non-governmental groups, um, or government groups um, for a long time. Um, but there's been an absolute transformation in the scope and the scale of open source research, thanks to developments in digital technologies and in particular the Internet, which means that uh, non-governmental groups now have access to resources that were previously only available to a very few governments. So I'm thinking about satellites. I'm thinking about um, the ability to look at newspapers all around the world, not just in your home language. I'm looking at the connectivity between different communities. And also we have uh, this amazing resource of user generated content um, from which victims of atrocities or uh, neighbors of weapon systems um, or first responders of disasters are commenting taking photos, taking videos and uploading them to social media, making things visible in, a, in an unprecedented way. Um, so some features of this are that it's essentially collaborative. Um, it involves communities often self-organizing around Twitter. Um, and there is no doubt that it's made a difference to what different groups can know about nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation. So a lot of our big reveals recently um, about Iran, and about China and about North Korea have come from this sort of non-governmental online open source research. So I hope it's clear from that, that some of this open source research directly intersects with the functions that we typically associate with treaty verification. Um, and there's all sorts of ways that I could define treaty verification. Uh, I'm going to go 
to Alan Cross's book, um, Verification, How Much is Enough, that was published in 1985 and remains a benchmark for understanding about verification. And I, and I say that with confidence because I see the assumptions that it reports uh, uh, constantly referenced and invoked um, in uh, debates around verification and in the ways that verification is, and treaties are talked about. You know, are, are treaties verifiable is often taken as a shortcut to whether treaties are worth it or desirable, um, which I think Alan Cross really explains uh, well in his book. So I'm going to quickly whistle through uh, some of Cross's key points with full apologies that I'm not going to capture the nuance that he presents. But some of his main points that I think are relevant in assessing open source research are that verification is it comprises an interface between technological systems and political frameworks, that it doesn't really make sense to talk about technologies in isolation. Um, and it also is not helpful to talk about verification in abstraction from the political ends to which it's, it's aimed. So you kind of need to think about verification of what? Of a, what are you trying to verify? What are, what's the treaty that it's associated with trying to do? Um, Crass also outlined some really uh, two key purposes that verification was serving in the treaties that he reviewed. One of them is that verification is useful, is hoped to build, be used to build confidence in compliance. So state parties look to each other, use verification to uh, show to each other that they are in compliance with their commitments. And another purpose that he identifies is that verification can deter cheating by providing a sort of credible threat that would be proliferation will be discovered. Um, there's also key points about who does verification in, in Crass's account, which is reflecting the strategic assumptions uh, that, he, that he was uh, working within. Um, so for him, it's states that do verification, either through their national technical means or through an internationally negotiated arrangement that's administered by an international organization. So there's a sort of uh, partnership between states and international organizations. Um, and within this, uh, most of his work was thinking about the USA and the USSR, but he did recognize that there's a real patchiness on um, what, uh, how, how different states, the, the ability, the capacity of them to have national technical means. Um, uh, there's also a question mark that he has about uh, legitimacy of different methods and that different verification systems set up different uh, legitimacy for tools and methods. Um, and of course, he raises fundamental pro problems, ambiguities, challenges with these traditional understandings of verifications. And two that I'd point out are it's unclear what verification systems can do about false alarms. So there's an allegation of cheating that's wrong. Uh, can verification systems cope with that? And also, kind of bigger than that, what do they do when they detect some non-compliance? Um, there's a kind of huge question mark with verification systems about non-compliance. Um, I'd also say that he makes it very clear that he thinks verification is possible. Um, and since he wrote his book, we've had the CFE, the Chemical Weapons Conven Convention and the CTBT, um, which kind of uh, echo his identification of a wider trend towards more robust verification. Anyway, so making sense of open source research with this kind of very traditional framework. Um, as I said, I think Crass is still very relevant in terms of political discourses around verification. Um, and I think within those traditional understandings, open source research represents a number of really significant opportunities and very definite challenges uh, to the possibilities of developing robust verification in the future. So the first of those opportunities, um, I think it's clear that open source research, because more people do it through more diverse ways, it has increased the deterrence function. Well, it, it has a capacity to increase the deterrence function um, associated with verification. So as I mentioned, um, some really important big reveals about, how, about uh, cheating, uh, uh, or cheap, uh, violations of norms in any case have been uncovered by non-governmental groups. Um, I'm thinking there particularly about the, the use of chemical weapons in Syria. I know that formerly at the start of when that started to happen, it wasn't a violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention, but open source research was really important in finding out what was going on there. Um, open source research 
is often cheaper and quicker and more agile than international organizations and less bureaucratic than national technical means. So it has some advantages, I think, um, over traditional verification. You have um, a few minutes. Okay, I'll whiz through, thank you. Um, it can also help with the absolutely huge amounts of digital data the world now has and the attendant misinformation, <clears throat> excuse me, different disinformation claims. I think this, this field of open source research can be enormously useful if it's harnessed correctly into uh, uh, authenticating uh, information and also saving it for a future date. Um, uh, but of course, you know, I'm going to move on to the complications now. I think it's vastly misunderstood and to an extent it's unusable by states and by the international organizations that might be able to take the next steps um, and uh, use it to reinforce uh, the strengths of treaties. Um, so um, to say a little bit more about that, um, I think it's very precarious. I think uh, the open source world is full of people doing things in different sorts of ways in a not joined up way. Um, and they're dependent on funding like everything else. And so uh, invitations to look at open source research as a sort of new digital panopticon of a whole bunch of digital sleuths seeing any, anything anywhere in the world. I think they're really misguided because there's no sense in which uh, uh, they're, they're not evadable, uh, these, these systems. Anyway, I'm going to very quickly uh, sum up uh, with a few kind of themes uh, that have come out of my research. I think open source research is definitely here. I don't, th I don't think it's going away. I think uh, it's making a difference. You know, we see, we see newspaper reports based on it all the time. And so without care, uh, systems like the IAEA, or the Chemical Weapons Convention, OPCW, they could be undermined by this growing set of sleuths. The, the, um, the, the speed with which uh, open source researchers can respond to things and generate findings could undermine the very careful uh, data collection that goes on in verification. Um, and uh, uh, without systems to double check that they're doing things right, uh, I, think, I think that could be a problem. Um, and there's a huge pressure because the speed of digital data um, is, is, is here to stay as well. I think there's huge pressure to kind of come to conclusions quickly um, and, and respond to uh, allegations of non-compliance quickly, which again could be really destabilizing for, uh, for treaty verification. However, with CARE, I think there's definite scope for treaty regimes to harness this more effectively than, than, than uh, those dangers might indicate. And in particular, I think going again back to Alan Crass and back to former understandings of verification, ideas around standing consultative um, arrangements where communication is facilitated to try and uh, uh, deal with allegations of non-compliance might be a good idea. And I also think uh, standardized systems of practice for open source research, kind of a, 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 a more, maybe not um, a uniform methodology because it's quite advantageous to have diverse methods, but a more recognized, more transparent, a more a better understood system of methods um, would, would help um, people use the results. Anyway, thank you very much. Sorry for the very quick rush through. Uh, over to you, Patricia. Thanks. And that was really interesting. Thank you. No, you're fine. You are one minute over time, which I think is brilliant. Uh, uh, and there was a lot in there. So thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. OK, so we move on to our last presentation, which is from Robin. So again, Robin, feel free to share your slides if you have slides. I think you said you didn't have slides, didn't you? Yeah. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So fire away and um, I will let you know. Sorry, it's always the way when you're when you've got your microphone off or when you're teaching, your phone goes. It's, it's classic. All the dog barks, or there's something. Um, so far away, and um, I will let you know when you're when you're close to time. Thank you. Great, thank you. So hi everyone, it's uh, my first time here. So nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, thank you for having me today and, and giving me the opportunity to uh, discuss my research here. So my name is Robin. I am working at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, where I'm a second year PhD researcher in international relations. And my research focuses on the idea of strategic stability and how demonstrations of um, disruptive military technologies reconstitute uh, new and different meanings of this concept. 
And the abstract that I submitted for this working group is based on the uh, second chapter of my dissertation, in which I basically lay out my theoretical um, approach to the idea of strategic stability. So in contrast with, with most of the other presentations uh, in this first panel, I think my presentation has a bit of a broader theoretical and, and conceptual uh, perspective to it. And it is still sort of, well, a work in progress uh, like the other ones as well. Um, nonetheless, I think it fits the broad theme of this conference quite well because it is an attempt to put one of the oldest and, and most prevailing concepts uh, in the debate on nuclear weapons and strategic stability into sort of a new theoretical uh, light. And like I said, I'm not gonna use a PowerPoint for this talk, but I'll address three main points um, in order to, to make my argument, which is that the idea of strategic stability is actually a contingent uh, product of social construction uh, produced through discourse, produced through international practices, instead of a fixed uh, concept with a universal value or with an objective uh, meaning. So first I'll touch upon a few theoretical considerations to briefly frame uh, the argument in the wider context of IR theory. Uh, second, I'll go a bit deeper into how strategic stability was um, conceived and how it has been invoked in the nuclear debates over the past few decades. And I then explain that the meanings of the concept uh, can differ according to how one talks about it and how one acts towards it. And third, I'll go over some of the implications um, that follow out of this new approach to the idea of strategic stability. So let's start simple. Uh, the concept of strategic stability is, and I think nobody will be surprised, uh, an artifact of the Cold War. And yet it is still very actively being used today, perhaps even more so than during that period. And especially during the last decade or so, all sorts of stakeholders um, have been putting forward largely similar questions that focus on strategic stability being under threat by certain new geopolitical realities or by particular uh, military technolo technological innovations, think of artificial intelligence or hypersonics. But when those questions are being posed, there's rarely any reflection on the object that is supposed to be under threat. And it is actually surprising, I think, that from a theoretical IR perspective, the concept has not really been under much scrutiny outside of the maybe expectable uh, rationalist or uh, realist inspired accounts. And so because strategic stability, in my opinion, is a social creation more than an objectively observable um, state of affairs, I thought it was time to approach the concept from more socially oriented uh, ideational theory of international politics, and this with a focus on the social construction of uh, reality. And although there are many, many different variations of social constructivist thinking in IR, I think one of the basic premises is that the structures in which most of international politics is uh, embedded are a contingent product of social and historical circumstances that they are constructed and that they are not of seemingly natural or evidential uh, conditions. So these social structures vary from uh, overarching ideas such as anarchy, as uh, Alexander Wendt uh, attempted to illustrate in 1992, to more specific concepts, I argue, um, such as strategic stability. Now that these structures of uh, international uh, politics do not naturally or organically emerge, but are instead socially constructed, means that there is a, a social process taking place that constitutes what we consider reality and that this process should be duly investigated and understood in order to make any theoretical, but also practical claims about these social structures. And so therefore social constructivists pay attention to the discursive uh, processes that produce or produces the and shapes these social structures and the practices that are an integral part of this process. So far, some of the uh, overarching, very concise theoretical considerations uh, that form the basis of, of my research. So let's dive in a bit deeper on the idea of strategic stability itself. Um, the concept emerged in a particular US strategic culture, I argue, where it was cultivated in the minds of uh, several prominent uh, Rand Corporation thinkers and later found its way into the discourse of some key uh, public officials, such as, for example, um, Robert McNamara in the, in the late, late 1960s. And not, I'm not going to digress on this too much because I think most of us present will, will have a pretty good idea of where the notion came from, but I, I can perhaps uh, elaborate a bit on this. Uh, during the discussion later. But I think it's important though to understand that this strategic culture was the main breeding ground for uh, nuclear stability thinking. 
and key elements of strategic stability, such as uh, second strike capability, mutual vulnerability, or uh, the mutually assured destruction uh, thinking, originated in the minds and the ideas of these strategic thinkers. And by continuously employing them in, in what I call nuclear discourse, they basically became institutionalized in the US by the 1970s and known under this catch-all phrase of strategic stability. It took a while though, and a lot more of that socialization process. So the continuous uh, references to this idea of strategic stability before it was actually employed by, by academics and strategic thinkers in the USSR. But in the late 1980s and, and late uh, or in the 1990s, through these processes of socialization and institutionalization on a more global scale, strategic stability quickly became considered a strategic reality that was objectively there for everyone and something to be achieved or to be maintained. And I think this tendency has actually increased in recent years as well. When we look at the discourse on strategic stability, both in the academic field and in the policy field, we see that many, many different meanings exist and that stakeholders refer to strategic stability when they actually mean something slightly uh, or completely different. And in James Acton's uh, 2013 work on strategic stability, a uh, former US Undersecretary of Defense is cited. We said that there are largely three different uh, ways of employing the concept of strategic stability, either in a narrow way that focuses on crisis stability and arms race stability, in a broad way that focuses on the absence of armed conflict between nuclear armed states, and in an even broader way that focuses on a global security environment uh, where states enjoy peaceful relations. And this way of categorizing the use of strategic stability in the academic field and in the policy field, uh, I think is actually confirmed in, in my literature review that I, I wrote for the, the, the PhD chapter and in a discourse analysis of international actors, speech acts and documents on strategic stability. But then the question is why that so many different meanings uh, of this concept of this idea exist. And I argue that because strategic stability is a social creation, a social uh, structure of international politics, it is built on rules and, and common understandings that are made and, and reproduced by international practices. So just for example, arms control negotiations, um, international summit meetings, or the showcasing of new uh, weapon systems, think uh, AI and, and uh, hypersonics, uh, as we have seen in, in recent years. And at the same time, these international practices are meaningful or only meaningful because meaning is attributed to them in this, uh, this whole, this ensemble of intersubjective rules that, follow, that forms this social structure of, of strategic stability. So they are mutually constitutive. And in a sense, this means that what some would call a strategically stable state of affairs is only stable because we speak of it that way and we act towards it uh, that way. You have and therefore, to... yeah, thanks. Uh, therefore, it is important for us as an academic community, I think, to, to explain and to understand how strategic stability that might seem like a natural uh, strategic reality is in fact uh, constituted by international practices and the accompanying uh, discursive uh, processes that, uh, that are there. And so now uh, come to the final part of my talk. What are some of the, the implications of this approach to strategic stability? Um, first, I think we should steer away from relying on the idea of strategic stability as if it would only mean uh, one thing. I think it is inevitable that because there are so many different discursive practices that, at play that, that shape this social structure, uh, the concept will mean different things in, in different contexts. And therefore we should be very clear about the meaning we give to strategic, strategic stability when we write or when we speak about it, because if we keep using it as a container term for all things nuclear, uh, nuclear stability, we risk an environment, I think, in which actors will be talking past each other instead of which, with each other. And then second, and I'll finish here, uh, I think there is a clear and so far quite untapped uh, research avenue that shows a lot of potential here by uh, applying the theoretical perspective of social constructivism on a team as this, I think we open up space for studies that focus on the uh, discursive and the ideational processes that are at the basis of strategic stability, and that can shed a new light on the uh, remaining potential of the concept for strategic deliberations and the real relevance that it can still have in, uh, in the 21st century. 
So I'll stop here. I give the word back to you, uh, Patricia. Like I said, it's still a work in progress. So I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing your questions, uh, your input and your uh, suggestions. Thank you. Lovely, again, great, thank you. Um, definitely had a, a lot of very interesting discussions today, all about uh, different understandings, um, different um, uh, um, attitudes. Uh, I've got a number of different notes that I've, that I've made down, but I don't want to influence the discussion. So if I open it out um, for questions, and um, we've got plenty of time, it's um, quarter past one now. So um, we'll see how we go. I mean, I, I'm always a big advocate of breaks. Um, so if we do have an opportunity for just sort of um, even five minutes, uh, we've got, we should finish at 1.55. Um, it, it, if we can finish a little bit earlier than that, that would be great because it's nice to move around and um, get a coffee or something like that. And um, before, Nick, is your hand up? Cause you've got a question or was there a sort of a procedural? Okay. Um, OK, well, I can see the first hand up is, is Nick, then I have Benoit, then I have Paul. Lovely. OK, so shall we go in that order? Uh, and then um, as more hands come up, then we'll we'll go from there. So can I just say, Paul, I love your background. I think that that's great. That It's nice to have a nice to have a change from bookshelves and plants. Lovely. Uh, OK, so uh, Nick, do you want to fire away? Yep. thanks very much, Trish. Yeah, uh, great, great panel. Um, it did what we hoped it would do, which is sort of uh, wrestle with um, some concepts that I think need a lot of wrestling with. Um, I have um, I had a question for, for Jim, but he's gone, so I'll email him. Um, I have a question for Fabian and uh, for Robin. Uh, for Fabian, um, just going to be a little bit uh, picky and, and controversial. Um, I mean, I, I kind of want to know a bit more your own perspective. Uh, uh, perspective um, and, and whether you actually think the left of launch is just a fancy way of saying counter proliferation. Um, I think I want to I want to push you a little bit more on your own um, uh, view of it other whether you think it is a distinctive um, and if you don't think it's distinctive you know why why is it being used why is there this this particular distinction being made particularly in the US community. But Robin <clears throat> I mean, Robin, I, I share, I think, a lot of um, concerns, as you do, um, around the term strategic stability. And I'm particularly worried about it in the context of current affairs between the US and China and this discussion about mutual vulnerability, because I often find that concepts get linked together, right, rather problematically. And if, if mutual vulnerability is um, a condition that needs to be made public, I don't think it does, but if it's a condition that exists and, and both parties see merit in making it public in order to you know, get something else like arms control, um, then strategic stability, again, another problematic term, starts to come into play in a different way because it becomes an end goal. And, and there's a sense that you have to keep things up, you have to maintain things. And one of the reasons I don't like mutual vulnerability is it because it probably entails um, main, you know, keeping up with your competitor rather than you know reducing and uh, and and the like. So I don't see it as a positive um, term. So I kind of wanted to push you on this linking of terms and where stability, strategic stability, in a way, feeds into a whole host of other <laughs> problematic terms. One being, as I mentioned, mutual vulnerability. So maybe I could just, and of course, that's also something that I think works very well with the way that you think about it theoretically. Uh, strategic stability. I'll leave it there. Um, shall we uh, shall we take a number of questions and then respond to them rather than working through each question, or would each person like to take each question in turn? Uh, I'll maybe sort of uh, leave that out for well for everyone actually to chip into. How do, how do you like it? Shall we maybe take a few questions and then come back to them? And let's try and do it that way. And if we don't like it like that, then we'll work on each individual one. Okay. So uh, Benoit. Right, sorry, I'm muted. So thank you all. Um, quick question for, for Robin, because I was, I was intrigued with the, the approach of, of strategic stability. First, I mean, as, as you always say, I'm much better in com at commenting on anything in writing. So if you want to send me a paper, I'd be happy to read it. Uh, but the one thing that I was surprised about is that you, you're, assuming that the use 
of the notion of strategic stability intends to be politically productive. Whereas we have a lot of scholarship on nuclear discourse that essentially shows that vagueness is meant to produce exactly what it produces, which is no change of power structures in political stalemate. So there is that element, and you can find the same thing with the use of the notion of disarmament, which you know, can, you, can mean both a process and an end state, so people can agree on the term without agreeing on anything else and therefore not doing anything. Um, and the other element is that there is kind of a, a lot of scholarship on how in the nuclear realm, there is a particular oddity of the meaning of terms and the use of terms and the fact that they in the nuclear realm mean the opposite of what they would mean outside the nuclear realm. That's something that Shelv and I have called reversification. And I think there's a lot of that at play uh, with strategic stability. So happy to you know, talk more about this. Sorry, I'm muted. I can see. I'm actually typing a message to Lyndon, and I'm thinking, why am I typing a message? I may as well just uh, just say it. Um, are we okay to take the, the three questions and then come to you, Lyndon? Is that okay? I think if we try and take it in threes, that helps that we don't veer too much off track, but that we try and sort of um, address each person's question. So if that's good with you, I saw your thumb up. That's lovely. So, um, Paul? Um, are you okay to raise your question? And then we'll take it out to a panelists to respond to all three questions. We'll try it that way. Okay, thank you. Well, I think these are interconnected. Uh, first of all, on strategic stability, is it really a, a, an artifact of discourse uh, originating in the Cold War, which was actually the only time nuclear weapons were ever part of the, the conversation? That's where it, where it began. But isn't it inevitable that political and military and intelligence organizations will scan the horizon for scenarios which frighten them? I mean, isn't that their job? Uh, and how, how, how in a in a world of armed nation states, are you ever going to stop that kind of consideration in, inside capitals? Um, and, you, and that will lead to various uh, concepts of threat and, 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 and st stability. But how, how is that escapable? So some form of that is going to occur, which perhaps connects with the uh, left of launch question, because for such organizations, left of launch interference is absolutely terrifying. Um, so isn't isn't the the mere possibility of left of launch uh, actions by strategic rivals a real spur to endless in innovation and uh, and and maybe uh, vertical proliferation? Final point um, on trust uh, and Henrietta will know how skeptical I am about the way that open source will be allowed to impact very much on disarmament because um, it. It, it can be faked, it, can, it will be denounced as being faked, it will be kept off the agenda, uh, it, it will be regarded as inadmissible in, in pr proper disarmament organizations. Um, and this is all part of the major problem of disinformation and the, 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 the advanced playbook of obstructors and cheats. Um, one of the easiest things you do is to say all these things are lies and false flag operations, and you maybe start producing um, lies yourself, which can then be denounced um, to, to water down the case against you. How in a radically distrustful and worsening world do you ever stop that? That's all. Lovely, thank you, Paul. So, so we've got a lot, quite a lot of detailed questions there. Um, and I know when, it, when you're a panelist, there's nothing worse than having a question than the thinking, ah! <laughs> how do I answer that? So I will take it to you guys to, to um, respond. And if we go in the order that's on the agenda um, in terms of response. So if we start with uh, Fabian, is there anything that you would like to add? I would pass it on to Artur. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, directed at me, but uh, Artur gave the, the excellent remarks on left of launch, so. Okay, thanks, then I'll, I'll, I'll take this on. So the first question, uh, from Nicola was on uh, whether left of launch is really counter proliferation. Well, I think the honest answer is that we cannot know because existing literature doesn't care and available primary sources do not share. 
Uh, but if I try to be more serious, um, so I, what I try to what I try to do is just to depict the two different views, the two uh, parallel narratives, so to say, that are out there that you know we can recognize that exist without uh, you know casting judgment on it. So the one one view is the narrow view, which is just about engaging to be sub platforms, and the more holistic view is, uh, and and again I, I can I can uh, cite a few examples. So for example. The Defense Science Board, which is a civilian advisory body to the DOD on science and technology. So they published a study report on strategic surprise. And this is one of the instances when uh, they discuss how missile defense should be more holistically understood. And it should be about engaging uh, the entire kill chain of the adversary. So the ability to launch a missile in the first place and not just the specific missile platform. And of course, this could mean. Uh, penetrating the adversary's missile enterprise, uh, and by that I mean the development, the ability to de uh, develop, the ability to deploy, and also the ability to launch uh, missiles. So the question is really how holistically you look at uh, the uh, notion of preventing a missile from being launched. And just to give you a real life example, uh, in 2017 there were a few uh, articles in the New York Times about how the DPRK has. Uh, seen a very high number of uh, missile test failures in 2014, so towards the end of the uh, second administration of, of President Obama. And there were some rumors that this might be due to US interference in the supply chain. So just providing uh, not functioning, uh, problematic broken sp uh, spare parts to DPRK through, well, they are trying to acquire these means illicitly, and then, of course, a counter-proliferation approach would be just to try to poison uh, their supply chain and to try to uh, break the missiles before even you know they could be launched or even tested. So I would say that uh, this is the more holistic view, and I would say that my so I think left of conflating left of launch counter-proliferation would be uh, problematic because counter-proliferation is an existing doctrinal term. But my ultimate argument is that right now the lack of conceptual clarity presents the problem of these being potentially uh, conflated. And just uh, on Paul's question about left of launch being uh, absolutely terrifying and contributing to arms racing dynamics. Well, I would say that it's just uh, with regards to strategic stability, we need to be actor specific. I think, you know, we cannot talk about strategic stability in, in, in the general in general terms, and also uh, left of launch is not something that, you know, it's a it's not a universal concept. We need to be actor specific. So let's say the US does not accept mutual vulnerability vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, North Korea, then they might look at options how to defend against their missiles, including active missile defense and passive missile defense. And then they might realize that this might not provide them enough certainty. Uh, and if they want to reduce that vulnerability, which apparently they are trying to do, then they would, of course, have to resort to offensive measures. And that's how left of launch uh, comes into the picture. And of course, the reaction, uh, the action reaction dynamic is there. So I agree with you in the sense that, you know, if you only look back in the past two months, uh, the uh, testing record of, of the DPRK was quite um, impressive. They are actively trying to diversify the delivery platforms of their, uh, of their, uh, of their warheads. So, Yes, there is an action reaction dynamic at play, but also if you consider it from an actor specific, if you take an actor specific uh, view, then the US can make that um, decision that they do not accept uh, mutual vulnerability with the DPRK and then they will try to act on that policy. Great, thank you. So, so should we move on Henrietta? Would you like to reply? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you, Paul. You know, yes, I, I had anticipated your question. To, you know, I, we've, we've talked about it before. So um, uh, I think it's a really interesting point. You know, will open source research be allowed to interface with formal systems? And, and, and maybe or maybe not. I don't know. I, my answer to you, though, is I don't think it can help but be involved. You know, it's now such a sector. It's so impacting on how uh, individuals understand and interpret the world. I think it's it's there. I think you can see it in in people's responses, in official circumstances, in if, uh, official uh, interactions. Um, their understanding about uh, proliferation. 
exploration and using by the open source world. So then the question becomes, um, is open source research going to make it worse? Is, is it going to make the very messy, complicated information environment messier and more complicated and harder to nav navigate? Or will it help? Because I think that this nascent sector has the tools to really make sense of that contested information environment and things like it, it can distinguish between misinformation and disinformation and authentic information it's very hard and it takes a long time and it takes a lot of resource but open source researchers do have these tools um, and uh, and so if there were systems it, like like the ones that I mentioned if there were systems for standardizing the work so that it was better understood by decision makers so that they used the best bits of it well and weren't undermined by the messy bits of it then it then it might help i don't know if that you know i'm sure that you expected me to give a different sort of <laughs> to your uh viewpoint yeah thank you that's lovely uh, thank you and uh robin okay thank you uh patricia um nicola so first on, on your question about mutual vulnerability i think it is indeed true that it is now seen as a sort of condition instead of uh, a concept of its own, I think, in the relationship with the US and China. And um, the, exactly what I'm trying to say here is that this problem with or this, this uh, idea of strategic stability is seen as uh, an end, uh, a means that needs to be maintained, of needs to be uh, achieved. Um, and that we are still always looking for more uh, concrete um, concepts, concrete concepts that are under this container term of strategic stability and that they, these concepts always have some sort of uh, conceptual issues or, or unclarity. Um, so I think your, 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 your question was spot on and I think you, you're absolutely right there. Um, Benoit, let me, um, I don't know if you, if you had a specific question, I, I'll, I'll definitely take you up on the, um, the uh, suggestion that uh, I can send the, my paper to you for uh, some more specific uh, comments, but um, I, I didn't really uh, know if there was a, an actual question or if you just gave uh, some feedback. So I, yeah, I mean, so the question was, are you assuming that the people who mobilize the notion of strategic stability are actually pursuing something specific or does your framework allow for the possibility that what they pursue is no change uh, okay okay um no i think it, it it's definitely not always um the case that they pursue it in a in a in a knowing knowingly way i think um i think sometimes because this strategic stability structure is already there. They don't really understand or they, people or actors don't really know um, that it is um, that it is a specific or that it has a specific meaning and they use it in the meaning that they think it for them it is it is useful. Um, but so I, yeah, I don't know if that um, if that answered the question, but uh, and then uh, Paul. Uh, I think you said that it is inevitable that these concepts um, are looked for or are searched by by policymakers, and and, uh, and that's true, I think. Um, but the, the the point I wanted to make here, I don't I don't think it is problematic that there are that there is a, a sort of look for or search for for concepts to think about uh, or to handle uh, the nuclear re realities of today. But I think that there should be uh, that we should notice and we should. Um, be aware basically of the fact that these concepts mean different things for for different uh, different actors um, and so if we use it in one single way uh, like uh, arturo also said if we use it in in a single way and not actor specific then i think we will be talking past each other uh, the whole policy field will be talking past each other or the uh, the academic field as well uh, instead of with each other so i think that's a, a very important pain point uh, point to make here wonderful uh oh and i've got i was going to say my thing saying that there's four hands paul um okay shall we i can see i've got a number of hands up shall we take it three questions at a go um uh paul if we try and do it that way depends if, depends if the questions are short if they're long i'm just mindful of time does that sound okay okay lovely so uh linton did you want to go first 
Thanks very much. Um, yeah, uh, a question uh, for Fabian, and then um, maybe just a comment about Paul's question and, and Henrietta's sort of response in that conversation. So Fabian, um, great presentation, like I always love, you, you know, clear, concise, <clears throat> um, nuanced in, in various ways as well. So I really just interested, you talked about, um, I think towards the end of your presentation about how um, there was the functional approach highlights need to consider non-material factors in the analysis generally. And so just, I'd love to hear more about that. Like, where does that lead you in your, your PhD proposal design? Like, if that's sort of coming out of what you've read so far, how do you think about approaching that, that issue? Um, and then just to sort of uh, come back to, to uh, Paul's comment around trust and disinformation and, and that whole discussion with Henrietta, um, I think what's really interesting in that space is that if you look at research that's coming out of the commercial world, um, and I think, for example, of like Microsoft and the BBC, these are obviously people that have a great interest in countering misinformation and disinformation. And they put together a coalition called the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, which I think would be a set of attributes that would be essential for, for any open source verification work. Uh, and, and they are aware that what they need is a sort of multi-factor approach with content tagging and security and verification of the authenticity of the source and all that stuff. And when they got to the end of it, they said, so how would we do that? And the answer was, well, they do it on a blockchain. So that's what they're doing. Um, so that's what the BBC is doing in order to, to pursue its, um, what's it called, uh, project origin in order to verify and authenticate the, uh, that sources being read on official websites are actually from those sources. So it's only one aspect of the answer, but I think it's an interesting part of the potential picture. I'll leave it there. That's lovely. Thank you, uh, Lyndon, very interesting. Okay, uh, Henrietta and then Arthur. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm, I've got a comment for Fabian. I'm not responding to Lyndon's comment. Um, and, um, uh, Fabian, I was really interested by uh, your idea, your suggestion to, to think about regulating use and function rather than bits of kit. And it's just a comment really to mention that the Chemical Weapons Convention, I think really aims to do that. And I know other people in this meeting know a lot more about it than I do, but they have this general purpose criterion that defines chemical weapons as something that's used as a chemical weapon. And, and, and it's associated with kind of more material definitions of chemical weapons that, that grounds the verification. But ultimately the general purpose criterion uh, is really a nuanced and powerful tool to mean that the Chemical Weapons Convention can keep up to date with any technical technological developments going forward. So that's really powerful. The complication there is that that nuance is very hard to implement, that uh, people that are implementing treaties just kind of want a list of things that are outlawed, it, it feels to me. And so in the implementation stage of things, uh, people constantly have to be reminded that uh, the, the convention doesn't just stick to schedules of chemicals. It's it can be it can be adapted in all sorts of ways. It, well, it can be adapted in keeping with the general purpose criterion. Yeah, uh, thank you. Lovely, thank you. And Arthur. Uh, my question is also to Fabian. I really like your presentation. How finally somebody took on how the usage of the term domain is just all over the place. So, uh, congrats. And it just reminded me how deterrence is not necessarily about the absence of conflict or not certainly not about the absence of competition. It is about driving the state of relations with the other party to a level that you find acceptable to compete or fight on. And in that regard, I was wondering how you see the future strategic picture, given that more nations will likely possess more sophisticated non-nuclear strategic systems. And if you want to regulate the function of uh, the conventional precision strike, for instance, if I understood you correctly, then wouldn't that increase um, you know, reliance and reverse trends towards uh, more nuclear deterrence? And how does that fit with uh, making deterrence more credible and the entire low yield debate? So I was just wondering how, like, what would be the strategic implications of, of, of regulating the function of, of, let's say, conventional precision strike? Thanks. Okay, so uh, I think I think really, Fabian, it's over to you. And then um, 
and then we'll go on from there. So, Fabian. Perfect. Thank you so much for these excellent remarks and also the questions. And uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. Following following this this answer session, I have to hop off the call. I have another commitment. I would also love to to ask a couple of questions, but I think I will I will just um, write you guys an email. Um, okay. The first one uh, for Lyndon. So so what are these immaterial factors? I'm, I'm really glad you asked. I think they really kick in when you dive deeper into where do these functions come from because obviously they don't originate um, in nowhere and i think these functions what is behind them and they really relate to to different codes of conduct that are associated associated with the different domains which create differing norms and thresholds so i think you know, this is also like something that really separates the conventional from the nuclear domain, or you could also even include a subconventional domain in this. Um, and then you have three different functional domains. And I think within each of these functional domains, you have different prevailing codes of conduct, which are created and, and recreate different norms and thresholds that are important in these different domains and also clearly delineate these demands, uh, these, these domains, these functional domains for, from the other ones. Um, and, and, you know, in the end, I think this comes down to social construction. And, and I think in the strategic studies field, um, the idea of social construction often receives too little attention. And um, I, I hope that this, this approach to conventional nuclear integration, or, or more broadly, this, this functional approach to the, to the nuclear and conventional domains uh, can, can help highlight this a tiny bit. Um, and then how does this fit in within the PhD proposal? I think that would be part of the, the conceptual theoretical overview in the beginning um, of, the, of the PhD, but uh, that, is, that is still to be determined how exactly it's going to fit in. Um, uh, yeah, so I think, you know, just to, to, to comment on the, the comment made by, by Henrietta, um, I, I agree, like in, in the sense that functional arms control, it, it is a rather weak approach. And I think often uh, the feedback I get is, or, or not often, but like I, I heard sometimes that, you know, it's not ambitious enough um, or it, it would not be doing enough. And, you know, I agree. Like if you, if you have, if you declare that you're not going to use your precision strike capabilities uh, for, for nuclear missions, and obviously you could also just walk away from such a statement. So it is, it is not very strong. And it, I think, can only be the start of a broader dialogue and, and more engagement. But what I think is, is really good about it is that it's such an uncomplicated and cheap first step that could just be taken um, to, to advance the discussion or, or basically just to restart it at this point. And then uh, to Artur, um, how does the future look like and how does it um, interrelate with, with nuclear proliferation? Um, to be honest, I haven't I haven't really thought about that yet. I know there's a really good chapter out there, um, written by by what's it called Andrew, I think um, is his name, who has who has thought about strategic non nuclear weapons a lot, um, and from the University of Leicester. I forgot the name. I'm really sorry. I should know that. Um, but he has written a chapter. I I, sorry. Sorry, you meaning Andrew Futter? Yeah, exactly. My God, um, thank you. Yeah, um, he has written a chapter in a in a good volume that I can recommend in this regard. And it, further, if, if if you want to read a bit more, like to any of you guys um, about strategic non nuclear weapons, I've recently published a, a small report with the the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique on on that issue, um, which tries to delineate uh, the term a bit. Uh, and uh, and describes and defines different types of strategic non-nuclear weapons and their their distinct implications with regard to strategic stability. Um, with that, uh, thanks again for, for for the remarks. And unfortunately, I have to hop off now. Uh, but but thank you so much for that. Um, it was it was really interesting. It was a pleasure participating. I can just see there's a very quick note from Henrietta. Henrietta, two seconds. Do you want to quickly yeah, say? Sorry, Fabian. I didn't mean to imply the general purpose control. control sorry, was weak. I, I don't think it is weak. I just think it needs it. People need to be reminded of it constantly. The the full ramifications of it. Yeah, I think it's very strong. 
No, no, that is that is totally fair. No, um, I, I don't know. I, I think I, I picked something up at the beginning of your question, which implied that you know the functional approach um, is not the strongest. If I misunderstood it, I, I'm sorry. No, of course the 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 chemical weapons convention, the general purpose criterion, is is very strong. I totally agree, um, and it's also very unique. Um, um, Fabian, can you hold two seconds just to double check? Paul, was your question for Fabian? Um, Did you email um, him or not especially? Um, okay. No. Okay. No. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Paul. Sorry to have you waiting. Uh, okay. Would you like to uh, fire away? Well, I, I want to go back to this trust theme, which I think may recur later in the um, uh, the conference. Um, it, we face intensifying strategic competition and new technologies and computational propaganda, information warfare, all, all of that. Um, and it doesn't seem to me that blockchain is going to save us because any organization that uses blockchain will be denounced for using it wrong and um, uh, preju prejudicially. And, and we've what we need to keep in mind, I think, from most of these discussions, and to saying it now may save me having to mention it in my session, which is that the, the Syrian case is 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 wonderfully illustrative because it shows that the best organ the best organized consensually set up organizations whose purpose the OPCW is to sift truth from lies using advanced scientific means can still be utterly blocked. Um, probably most of the human race doesn't believe what the OPCW has found and won't because su successful information warfare floods, floods the zone um, and changes the politics of everything. And I think that's absolutely necessary to keep in mind before, before we easily accept that there are, there are benign sounding technical ways out of this, the, 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 this morass of un, um, unbelievability that the world seems to be going towards. And in that sense, the, um, uh, the, the idea that came up over uh, precision strike conventional weapons about declarations um, sounds to me interesting, but, you know, radically radically frail um if you do the thought experiment we're approaching um an imagined war over ukraine uh being actively thought about analyzed prepared for in, in staffs all, all, all over europe and beyond um, how much credence do you think that any of those military staffs would place in declarations and promises about the limited use of strategic conventional weapons. Do you think that really is the way the world works, that it, that it, that it could attenuate a crisis very much? A str strongly, a strongly pressed question. Um, really? Okay, so I hand it over to you guys. Um, I, we, we have Arthur and we have Henrietta. And we have Robin. Sorry, Robin. So do you want to take it in that order, Arthur? It just to chip in on uh, the credibility of declaratory policies, because my, my sense is Paul is getting to uh, that point. <sighs> well, yeah, I mean, <sighs> credibility is a complicated, uh, complicated animal. And it's not just up to, uh, you know, what you declare, but also what you have and what you, you know, what you're doing, like exercising and how you're posturing your forces. So I would agree that there are some actors uh, uh, in, 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 in 2021 that are less credible when it comes to their declaratory policies. And uh, ultimately, I believe that the job of military planners is to plan for not just uh, the credible, but also the worst case scenarios. So I, I, I can understand how, um, you know, that comes into play, uh, the dynamic that you mentioned. Okay, um, I think it is uh, Henrietta next. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so Paul, you know, I take your point, I share your concerns. Syria has been an enormous challenge on all sorts of uh, levels to, to lots of, to lots of um, global attempts to strengthen human security and respond to uh, bad things happening. Um, I think you overstate the case, you know, it, it, it might, you know, I'd have to do some research, but my my instinct is to say that most people in the world think that the OPCD the OPCW is lying. I think might be an exaggeration. I, I um, uh, and I don't think it's done yet. I think I'm 
I'm enormously impressed at the way the OPCW is slowly, carefully doing things that aligning uh, uh, information and the, the things that it has at its fingertips that it can do, it's, it's slowly taking actions. So it's not over, I don't think. So we'll, we'll see, won't we? And I, I, you know, but I, I totally, I totally recognise the world that you're describing that we're living in a messy, contested a, a area where trust is falling down, and it, relate, it relates to what Arthur was saying about credibility. These are difficult things. These are difficult times. Um, Lyndon, yes, you know, I think uh, there are signs of all sorts of emerging communities of practice around how to. Uh, legitimize, build credibility and open source research findings. Um, lots of them look and sound very similar to conventional understandings of the scientific method, um, I think. And I'll point to the Berkeley Protocol as being really uh, exciting in this area. Um, uh, at, it, it's tool agnostic, so it doesn't advocate for blockchain or anything it, because it, it feels that um, uh, uh, individual open source researchers will use the things that they're comfortable with and also the, the technologies will change so that they've they've written a manual for a uh, step-by-step approach to um, to conduct open source re uh, research in a way that means that its findings are usable by the International Criminal Court um, which is really exciting to me um, and going back to the Syria example Paul uh, it, it's it's giving a framework for the open source research community to streamline that effort so they don't all have to authenticate exactly the same tweet that that their systems for sharing things that are uh, transparent and reproducible um, and have this kind of quality of robustness um, that that we come to expect from peer-reviewed work yeah anyway thank you um uh interesting conversation Excellent. I think it's good to have. I think it's good to to push and question. This is what we're here for. So that's great. It's lovely to hear it. Thank you. Um, and it, it's nice to hear. You know, it's nice to hear. I, I shouldn't really say this, but I am. It's nice to hear differences of opinion because this is this is how we think. So it's it's great. Thank you, uh, Robin. Would you like to add anything? Just very briefly, maybe on uh, on the declaratory policy. Uh, I I kind of agree with what Arthur said, but I think. There is in 90%, 99 percent of the cases, I think there is still some value or still an important value uh, for these declaratory policies. And I think um, in some cases they might even be stronger formulated than uh, than actually meant by the actors. Uh, it, it, I think it can be similar to uh, where some actors are uh, identifying red lines that other actors should not cross and then in the end do not really react or act upon it. So I think these declaratory policies certainly have some uh, some value still uh, if that is what Paul meant at least thank you lovely great well we've got uh, we have finished five minutes early which is lovely so we've got um a 10 minute break to have a coffee just move around and then we'll be back for uh, the next panel which is rethinking deterrence and the nuclear future so just to say a massive thank you to everyone really for the panelists and for the questions um i think we started out really nicely and and it's good good to have a good mix of opinions and and a good mix of material to discuss so thank you very much and um you just need to use the same link again to come back um in 10 minutes time at two o'clock right thank you Bye-bye.